the thing that was going to save him was not going to be having fancier armor or a better weapon than Goliath anyway. His faith wasn't in his weapons. His faith wasn't in his clothes. His faith was not even in his slingshot, the thing that he did wind up taking into battle. His faith was in God. He had faith that God was going to protect him, and if that was going to be the case, what weapon he took into battle really didn't matter all that much. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place, and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. So we're just going to go ahead and dive right into this. The only thing you really need to know is that this is directly after David has come. He's seen Goliath. He has seen how impressive he is, how strong he is, but he automatically is like, I don't see why this guy is getting away scot-free with sort of disrespecting and calling out and defying and acting in open rebellion against Israel and Israel's God, and nobody here is willing to do anything about it, so he takes it upon himself to do something about it. Let's go ahead and look in 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 through 33. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. A couple really important things in this particular passage of Scripture. First of all, it proves where David's motives are. Does David want to do this because it's the right thing to do? Yep. Does he want to do it because he believes that that's what God would want him to do? Yes. Is he legitimately angry that this Philistine is going out and defying and, you know, basically verbally trashing Israel and God? Yeah, he's mad about that. But you'll notice there that when he states his own motivation, he says, let no man's heart fail him. This is why David was such an effective leader. He wasn't just thinking about his own feelings about the situation. He was also projecting outwardly. He was seeing that this man was making God's army terrified, and that shouldn't happen. That they should not be afraid of this guy when they have God on their side. And so David's thinking was, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to face this man down so that nobody's heart fails him. David's thought, first and foremost, was, I need to inspire other people to believe in God just like I do. That's why he was a great leader. Because he was thinking about other people and how his actions would influence them. And that's how we get the story that eventually that we do. The second part of that is, it kind of emphasizes the part, I mean, it's already been stated, but it really drives home this point that David is outmatched in every conceivable way. I mean, even if you just ignore the obvious, ignore the fact that Goliath is nine feet tall and this is a teenage boy, Ignore the fact that Goliath is decked out in gigantic armor and it says that his spear is so large that the shaft of his spear is like a weaver's beam. So, you know, to put that into context, it's like a 4x4. Four four. They're saying that's how gigantic his staff is, or his, uh, his spear is, and he's able to wield it because of how strong he is. This dude is a monster. Much bigger than any professional athlete or, or anybody that you've seen so far. And yet, David has the courage to go up against this person. But this really drives that home because even if you ignore all of the obvious stuff about Goliath just being a giant and having this really big, thick armor and everything, even if you ignore that, experience is still part of this, right? The fact that David, he's a kid that's never killed anybody. He's never been to war. He's never been in a confrontation, at least that we know of, with another person. Now, he had seven brothers, so I'm sure that he's done some roughhousing. But as far as like actual mortal combat with another human being, David's never done that. He's a shepherd. You know who has done that ever since he was David's age, and probably a lot younger? Goliath. 
So Goliath isn't just physically more imposing than him, he also has far more experience killing people than David has. David's experience right now is zero. And so this is what Saul is trying to drive home and impose upon David. He's like, look, David, you don't stand a chance against this guy. Even if you just ignore all that other stuff, this guy's been killing people. This guy has been a warrior since he was younger than you. You don't stand a chance against this giant. And David's response to this is, I'll be fine. I mean, he doesn't say that, obviously. But David is ready to take on this challenge. Saul is looking at this confrontation through worldly eyes. David is looking at it through spiritual eyes. He's saying, the hearts of the men in this nation are failing them because they're afraid of this giant. I'm going to take it out because that's what God would want me to do, and that is going to cause the other people around me to believe in God. David is seeing this all through a spiritual lens, while Saul can't look past the worldly stuff that is being presented right in front of his face. He can't see past that. So let's go ahead and continue on in this same story. In 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 37, where he says, But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came, to, to, uh, came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up again uh, against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. You see, to David, this was just another challenge. To David, Goliath is no more scary than the bear, no more scary than the lion, no more scary than anything he has faced in his life. Why? Because he knows he has God on his side. And if God is on your side, it really doesn't matter who's against you. If you have infinity, if we're going to put this in mathematical terms, do you know how much higher infinity is than one? Infinity. Do you know how much higher infinity is than a trillion? Infinity. It's infinity. It doesn't matter. It is equally larger than one number as it is any other number that is not infinity. And that's what God is. Goliath is no more a threat to God than the bear or the lion were. And David understands this, and because of this, he knows that he is going to triumph against Goliath exactly the same way and by exactly the same score as he triumphs against Goliath. That's why he's not afraid of this. And his courage is so absolute, he even convinces Saul. Saul, who has seen this thing through worldly eyes this entire time, and Saul, who also himself is a part of the Lord's army, and not only has not encouraged anybody else to go up against this giant, but he himself has not done so. He hears David's speech, and he goes, Yeah, go ahead. God be with you. He has decided to support David in this. David's courage has really affected even Saul. And so this is where the story kind of wraps up in verses 38 through 40. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in his pouch, and his sibling was in the in his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. So this is really the culmination of David's action and his preparation for the battle at hand, which I think speaks to us in the sense that we should never take weapons into battle that we don't know how to use. If we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing as Christians, we are engaged in spiritual welfare against evil every single day. Now, would the sword have been a better option than the slingshot? Yeah, probably. But not for David, because he didn't know how to use a sword. Now, we know from the scripture later, David gets pretty darn good at using a sword, to the point to where he slays 10,000 Philistines with one. Actually, it says tens of thousands, so we don't even know how many. But a whole lot of bad people died at the blade of David. But not yet. He has not used them yet. 
They're too big for him. They're too heavy. He can't even walk in these things. And so he just disregards them. Why? Because he knew that ultimately the thing that was going to save him was not going to be having fancier armor or a better weapon than Goliath anyway. His faith wasn't in his weapons. His faith wasn't in his clothes. His faith was not even in his slingshot, the thing that he did wind up taking into battle. His faith was in God. He had faith that God was going to protect him, and if that was going to be the case, what weapon he took into battle really didn't matter all that much. And because of that, he's able to do this. You see, there are a lot of people that try to put their faith in their weapon. There are people, for example, that are really knowledgeable about the Scripture, and, and that's a good thing, but they put their faith in their biblical knowledge, or they put their faith in their charisma, or they put their faith in their natural charm and the way that people tend to flock to them and like them. Those are all good weapons to have, but first of all, you shouldn't try to use them if you don't have them. I'm not a charming individual. I understand that. And because of that, I don't try to use charm to ingratiate people so that I can share the gospel with them. I use my knowledge. I use just you know, the scripture that I have available to me, my ability to recall and memorize things like that. That's what I use when I go into battle because I don't know how to use the other things. I don't have that natural charisma, and that's fine. Don't use weapons you're not familiar with and you don't know how to use. Take into battle that which works for you. And the reason that we are able to do that is because ultimately God is with us, and our faith should be in God, not in the talents that God has bestowed upon us not in the blessings that he has given to us. We should use them if we can, but if we don't know how to use them, we need to use whatever God has given to us. God is not going to leave us ill-equipped. God didn't take David's slingshot from him. He let him have it. And because David had faith that God was going to be the one that triumphed in this battle anyway, he was able to use it to its maximum effectiveness because God was with him. And so we need to put our faith in God, not in the things that we have been given. We don't necessarily have to have tons of experience, just like David had no experience in battle when he faced down Goliath. We don't necessarily need a formal education or all this fancy stuff. We don't need that natural charm or charisma. We don't need a lot of money or fancy clothes or any of those things. Those things can be helpful from time to time if we need them and if they're used properly and put in their proper place. But ultimately, we need to remember that to do God's work, the only thing we really need is faith. That's all David actually needed here. And because of that, he was able to triumph over his giants. And we can do the same if we have the same faith. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances. <laughs>